want to talk about this morning, is it? How you can really lift somebody else's spirit. Of course, we know this is biblical. Uh, Paul uses this uh, kind of this reference to this quite often as he addresses the different churches in which he writes his letters to, encouraging them that, uh, you know, it's just good. <laughs> it is just really good for church people to love each other, isn't it? Amen. I got a little amen out of that. Isn't it good for church people to love each other? Amen. Aren't you glad you're a part of Bayshore Church of the Nazarene where we love each other? Yes. I'm glad for that. I'm glad I can say as a pastor and say that not ashamed, unashamedly to any visitor or anybody that walks in, we're a church that loves each other. That's the people, right. yes. the people love. And I believe it comes out of their love for God and the love that they have for God and the love that God puts in their hearts and our hearts and uh, it causes us just to love each other. Well, Paul writes a letter to the church. We're back in Thessalonians again today and uh, again in chapter 5. And this whole chapter 5 is a great chapter. And it really talks about what Paul's really trying to do is he's kind of wrapping up talking to the church here. It's just saying, look, I've told you a lot of things and I've encouraged you in a lot of things. But it's the Spirit of God that's going to be working among you. And as the Spirit of God does work among you, there's certain practices that are going to be carried out. On down in chapter 5, we know that Paul says that he wants every person there, part of this church, to be sanctified through and through. And so what he's done then is he's given a picture of, of kind of what we talk about, the sanctified life, what it looks like as you live this life out. Sanctified simply means that you have given yourself completely to God knowing that God has the very best life for you. When you give yourself completely to the Lord, that's when He can work through you, uh, live through you, uh, do uh, the, the missions that He wants accomplished through you, and so it's just basically the very best life. Isn't, that, isn't it great that you got a pastor this morning that got up and told you that your life can be the best it could ever be when you know Jesus Christ? Yeah. And to know that you can live that way continually, day in and day out, living your life for Jesus. I want to tell you this. If you live your life for Jesus, you'll always have good days. Now, now don't get me wrong. That's not saying that there may be some days where th things happen. Uh, certain things that you're disappointed about. But what it means is that you have, just what we've said before, you have so submitted yourself to God that you can literally sing the song, the song, It Is Well With My Soul. It's well with my soul. I know things may be crashing around me, but I want you to know that I know that I'm in God's hands. I know that God is leading, guiding, and I'm trusting Him all the way. Well, in so doing then, there's the practice of it. There's this living this life out so that we know that we are just carrying on in the spirit of Christ. And so here's what Paul says. He says, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you, just as you also are doing. Now, the word edify there is the key word of the day. Edify. Let's just say that together. Edify. Edify. You don't say too much to people, but I'm going to edify you today, <laughs> right? Uh, and, uh, and if I'd have tried to use that in my sermon title, it wouldn't have gone with my alphabet that I'm preaching on this year. So another word for that is to build, okay? It's the word build. So basically he's saying build up, uh, therefore comfort each other and build one another up. In other words, lift each other up. We'll go over that in just a moment. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourself. That's an important thing, isn't it? Peace. Yeah. Don't you know that true peace comes from God? Yes. That's where it comes from. The Bible says that he will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on God. And I, and I really believe that uh, God's a positive God, and God's working through our lives, and if we keep our mind on Him, He'll keep us at peace. Now we exhort you, we get into the meat of this, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, a 
but hold the wheat. <laughs> you just love this line, don't you? Be patient with all. And so when we say be patient with all, what we're saying is show a little grace in life. Cut somebody some slack. Now, as you read scripture, you kind of read in between the lines. Of why is it that Paul is saying these things? And why is it that he's writing these things? Well, obviously in this uh, context, what he's saying is, you know, I know you got some people among you that don't quite line up. Okay? There are some folks that just have gotten a little unruly and they're just kind of a little out of step and it's going to be your job to help bring them back in, <laughs> back in step, bring them, to disciple them as we would call them, uh, to bring them along. But Paul says, what he said is, I want you to do this in a way that you're going to build them up, not tear them down. And there's really two ways you can... You can do this. And so he says, let's do this by building other people up. Well, the first thing that we know to this is this. That our actions can either inspire someone or others or discourage them. Now think about that. You can either be an encourager or a discourager. And so I hope that this morning you would just make it your goal in life to say... I'm going to be an encourager. I'm going to do what I can do to build up others and to lift up other people. Now here's what I know when, when uh, what's going to happen when you say that. God's going to put people in your path for you to build up. And sometimes the folks God puts in your path to build up, you might rather tear down. Because you say, Pastor, you just can't believe their actions. Well, here's what I always say to folks. You're never responsible for somebody else's actions. But you are always responsible for your response and how you treat somebody else. And so Paul says, as we're going through this process of helping people and, and, and being brothers and sisters in Christ, as also we're uh, families together, it, we want to be the kind of people that build people up, that encourage people, that inspire people people. We see this in the Old Testament, of course, and uh, people who, who kind of bear this out and show us kind of how this works. One of the great stories about this is Jonathan. Jonathan, we know, is Saul's son. Uh, Saul was the first king of Israel. Uh, we know that uh, Saul was king when uh, Goliath comes on the scene, and then it's David that comes along, and, and uh, even though Saul was king, it was David who come along and killed Goliath with his slingshot. And, of course, then everyone began to praise and lift up David. We also know that Saul had done some things that were a disappointment. And he'd done some things, of course, to where God said he was kind of sorry he'd ever made Saul, made Saul king. And so David had been anointed to be the next king that would sit on the throne. Of course, we know that Saul became a little bit jealous of that. And uh, jealous of David, and, and he began to seek after his life to the point where David had to be a fugitive. He had to take off. He had to. He had to be. He had to be on the run. And so there he is, knowing that uh, he had been anointed to be the king. But David, being very respectful of Saul, and had even at one point had the opportunity to kill Saul, uh, but yet he didn't. He just cut the hem of his garment recognizing that he said, it's not me, and I should never be the one to touch the one that God had anointed to be king. And so he didn't. David really was very respectful of Saul, even though he sought after his life. And then, of course, what we see is that while David's out there on the run, he and some of his men that had gone along with him, it was Jonathan, Saul's son, that comes along and begins to encourage David. And David stayed in the stronghold. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14. And David stayed in, the, in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness as if Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. Why is that? Well, just like the girl sung this morning, he's the way maker. 
He's the one that's really, he's the one that's doing the miracle working. And so Saul was never able to get to him. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Zeth in a forest. There he was. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened and strengthened his hand in God. And so here's Jonathan now, Saul's son, and he comes out to David. And you think about this. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to come out to, to David, but you know what? They'd struck up, they'd struck up a really, really close friendship together. They promised to be friends for life. And you know that's exactly what friends do. Friends want to do all they can to make sure that they're looking out after their friends. And so Jonathan comes out to David and in this, uh, in this story, in this account, it says that he tells David, David, I know that God's anointed you to be the king. Now at that point, David probably didn't feel like that. David may have been a little discouraged, and he needed some encouragement. What I say to you is that you have to look for the opportunities of people that you know that may need a little encouragement in their life. Life's just not going the way that uh, it should be going for them. It could be that they could be having uh, uh, just difficulties in life, perhaps with their job, maybe where they work. Uh, maybe right now they're part of the government shutdown. Who knows? You recognize that different things happen to folks or folks that may be having a physical need or uh, folks that someone in their family is having a physical need. What I'm trying to say is, is that God has placed people strategically in your life that he's saying to you, could you encourage them today? Could you take them a word of inspiration? Could you give them a note? Could you give them a smile? Could you, could you give them a word from the Lord that's going to encourage them today, knowing that, that God's still on their side? And that's exactly how Jonathan did it. He basically said to David, David, God's still on your side. God's still working in your midst. I know that you're out here in the woods right now. I know that it may not seem like it, but you know that God has anointed you to be the king. And David, that will surely happen. See, sometimes it just takes the word coming along from you or somebody else just to say to somebody. And I know it sounds like it's a cliche, but really it's the truth and you have to let the Holy Spirit do the work. When you tell somebody else, guess what? Hang in there. Don't you give up. You're going to make it. God's on your side. God has a plan. You say, oh, pastor, now why should I have to go tell them? They've listened to you preach. They, they've read the Bible. They, they've been to Sunday school. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit just wants to work through you another way of showing someone that he's the way maker. And it's going to take your voice. It's going to take your smile. It's going to take your word of encouragement that's going to be the one that's going to lift them up, that's going to encourage, that's going to encourage them in, in their heart. I think also of the Good Samaritan, as he went along that day and saw the, saw the man that had been passed by, two other fellows already, but he saw him there that day. He didn't even know him, but the man had been beaten, robbed, left for dead, but the Good Samaritan came along. You know what he did? He decided not to be a discourager. He, de he decided to be an encourager, an inspirer. And he picked up the man, it says, and he bound up his wounds, and he took him to a place where he could get some more help and some more need. So what was it that he was really doing? Sometimes we think about like David and Jonathan where you just give a word. But remember, sometimes your actions will inspire somebody else. And so you, 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 may, have to, you may have to do an errand for somebody. There may be something that you'll do for somebody else. But you're, you want to inspire and encourage other people, and you do that with your actions. Second thing is develop a character of giving and encouragement. Uh, think about that. In other words, that your character, you become known. Simple question. Would you rather, when you walk in a room, people to say, oh, here comes the discourager? <laughs> or the, here comes the encourager? Or let me ask you this. Who, who would you like to, who would you like to walk, what room do you want to walk into? You want to walk into a room where everybody's all discouraged and down in the dumps and 
No, you want to walk in where everybody's kind of encouraged and uplifted, don't you? Because yes. what happens? It's kind of contagious, isn't it? Yes. I often say that Christianity is more caught than it is taught sometimes. Yes. And the way that we do this is we recognize the fact that God has called us to have a certain character in our life to where we are, we are really making it a point to be inspiration to other people. You know what that... Folks, that's why I like Bayshore. Some of you may be here in your first time visiting with us. I just feel we get, I, I get encouraged because there's other folks here that encourage me. And I thank you for that. I hope that I've encouraged you. I don't want to be, get up here on Sunday morning and be a discourager to you as I preach. I want to tell you about the love of God. I want to tell you about the goodness of God. I want to tell you about the greatness of God. That's why I say we make it our motto. We make it our something. We don't ever grumble. Isn't it, the great, isn't it great to come to church and be among the people that never grumble? Right. Hey Amen. Does somebody be alive? Yeah, but that's true. They, we make that's one of our core values. We say that's, that's, that's rock solid. We're not going to grumble because why? We know we can turn to God for everything in our lives. We can turn to God for every need that we have. Well, there was one such character in the Bible, the New Testament, a Joseph, he, Joseph's. He gets a name changed to match his character. What do you think about that? The Bible says it right here. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. How about that? Here's somebody, uh, an example right in the New Testament of an individual who actually the disciples changed his name. He said, you know what we got to call him? we got to call him the son of encouragement. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's better than being called Beelzebub. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I found out he's the one that comes and wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the devil's work. We're not in the devil's work. We're in God's work. God's called us to be encouragers and to lift one another up and to build each other up. And it's okay if people kind of see that in your character and they may want to change your name to Barnabas. And they may not change your name, but then, and it'd be, na be nice to be in that circle, be called a Barnabas, right? You remember it was Barnabas when, when uh, Paul got saved. Uh, originally, it was, his name was Saul as well, but his name got changed to Paul. But when Paul got converted and and uh, he was wanting to meet all the rest of the disciples and the apostles and everything. They were a little fearful of Paul. Didn't really want to meet him. I mean, after all, this is the guy that had, uh, that had, that, that had brought Christians uh, to persecution, caused Christians to be killed. I mean, this was a guy that kind of was against everybody in the church. And then all of a sudden they're saying, hey, he wants to come to Bayshore. <laughs> we're not going to let him in here, man. We want people like us, right? But no, but here, here it takes Barnabas, and we find out that Barnabas is the one, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so when we see that, we recognize that Barnabas is one of these people that you want to be a part of your church because he's like, look, I want to tell you guys about how God has made a difference in Paul's life. Now think about this. Paul was a character, right? Yes. He was a character. And, uh, and, and he, had, he had done some things that some people should be afraid of. But Barnabas was willing to say, you know what I'll do? I want to tell others about Paul that... God has transformed your life. Not only did he do that with, with, uh, with Paul, uh, but he also brought good news to the churches. It says the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Right there, when you say you want to develop a character that, be, that is to be an encourager, there's the key. Know God in his fullness. When you know God in his fullness, 
I'm here to tell you today, I believe it changes your attitude. I believe it changes your countenance, the way you look. I believe that it changes the, your step. I know we're all getting a little older, it's a little harder to, to step. But we recognize the fact that, you know what, we know that on the, you know, I may be moving a little slow on the outside, but I want to tell you on the inside, I'm moving 100 miles an hour for Jesus Christ my Lord. And so we begin to say we're not, as long as we're here, God has a divine purpose, God has a divine plan. And so, but the important thing is, is to be full of the Holy Spirit. And it says that then there were those who were added to the church daily. So we want to, we want to develop a character that has us to be an encourager. The last thing here is this, and that is focus on the positive rather than the negative. And I know that kind of sounds like an old cliche coming from an old pastor, doesn't it? I mean, you just think about that, but it is really so true that if we're going to be the kind of people that's going to build other people up and inspire other people, then we're going to focus on positive things. Now, when I say that, that means the people you associate with. you got to look for the good in everybody. Yes. Hear what I'm saying? you got to look for the good in, the, in, in everybody. There was, there was one guy in the town, he passed away, and he was the town grump. I mean, he just, no one really got too much around him. And uh, so, but it was still a time when the neighbors went to the funeral home to see uh, that person had passed away. And while they were there, a lot of folks were just saying, I don't know, I don't know. One good thing, man, I don't know what I can say about this guy. He just, he was a real character, mean, rotten. Finally, one lady, she wasn't about to say anything mean. She always said something positive. And they turned to her and they said, Miss Polly, you always find something positive in everybody. And I bet you couldn't find one thing positive in this man. She said, Oh, he could whistle nice. <laughs> you see, sometimes you may have to look for it just a little bit, but you can find something positive and begin to say, Lord, help me to, help me to focus in on that. Because if you get focused in on the negative, you can never really help somebody else. You return back to the story, David again is such a, a great character. Remember Jonathan came and, and he encouraged David I believe David got encouraged by Jonathan, his friend, coming there that day and telling him, hang in there, don't, don't quit, don't give up. Uh, you're gonna, God's, God's got a plan for you. Well, David got to return that in later years. You see, Saul eventually was defeated. He, he and Jonathan both were killed. And it really, it really, really bothered David. David loved them both, really. Saul didn't even really know how much David loved him. But usually in that time, in that time period, if somebody, uh, if one king died and there was another king that followed, many times what they would do is they would, they would oust the family, any family member of that previous king. They'd make sure that, and sometimes some kings would even make sure that the other people in the family, that everybody else was killed. You still see some of that happening in today's world where somebody that may be a dictator and a of a country, they'll have a, somebody else in their family killed so they can't take the, take the position. But that's not how David operated whatsoever. We find out that, that David knew and tried to find out who the people were that were part of the family uh, of, of Saul. Again, the thing was in the New Testament is to build up, to edify. It says, now when Mephibosheth, said, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul had come to David. He fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Now look what David did to this. David didn't have to do this. But remember, Jonathan had come to David out there in the woods and said, David, I know that you'll sit on the throne one day. He encouraged David. He inspired David. David now has taken the, th the throne. And you might think at this point that he was bitter, that he would be mad at Saul for all those years he had to be on the run, for all those years that Saul mistreated him. 
But you know what David did? David didn't let any of that, any of those things that were done to him lead to bitterness or resentment in his life. Sometimes we think, well, I can't do anything for that other person. They've done me so wrong. They've said such terrible things about me. And David, David didn't operate like that. David said, is there anybody in Saul or Jonathan's family that I can get connected with? I want to bless them. I want to do good to them. I want to, I want to, I want to give to them. And sure enough, there was this son of Jonathan who when they were trying to escape way back there, he had been crippled in his feet. And so now David calls him in. Now he's probably scared to death thinking, oh man, this king is going to, he's going to have my head. But that's what David does. He completely surprises him. He completely says, I've not come here to, I've not had you come here where I can mistreat you. In fact, what David said is, I'm going to treat you good. I'm going to treat you, I'm going to treat you very well. And at that time, David uh, began to pour out uh, his blessings on him by restoring, giving him land, giving it and telling him you can come and eat at my table. In fact, he goes this far. Then Zidia uh, said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king has commanded his servants, so will your servant do. As for the thing said, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Amen. Now can you see this poor, poor little crippled boy uh, going in there thinking that he's going to be in trouble, thinking that he's going to be mistreated? Can you think how his spirits were lifted whenever he found out that David was going to pour a blessing on him and David was going to even say, here you go, you can eat at my table. Can I tell you something today? That's exactly what God wants to do for you. You may have been on the run for a long time thinking God's mad at you, thinking God hates you, thinking you've messed up your life in such a way that that, you know, you don't know what you can ever do to make things right. Can I tell you that's why Jesus came? Can I tell you today that that's why the Lord's at work in your life? That that's why the Lord's at work in your life right now? Because he wants to bestow grace on you and say, would you just come on in? Would you come, would you, would you, would you come on back? Would you come in? Because the Lord said, I want you to eat at my table. I want you to know that every day from now on, I want to bless you. I want to pour blessings out on you. And I'm here to tell you today, if you've moved away from God, if you've gotten a little cold in your step and your walk with God, God wants you to come home. He wants you to come back around the table. You say, why are you telling me that, Pastor? Because I want to encourage you today. <laughs> I want to encourage you in the Lord. I want to be an inspiration to you today. I want you to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that God, God is here to work in your life today. Can I also say to us, the church now today, who do we need to take that message to? Who do we need to tell? Who's God put on your heart and on your mind that you not need to say, you know what, I want to encourage you today. God has a bountiful supply for you. God wants you to come and to feast at the table of the Lord today. Oh, I believe that you know somebody. I believe that there's somebody, just like Paul said, we might know some people that are a little unruly. It might be a son, it might be a daughter, it might be a brother or sister, it might be a parent. You would say, yep, I can identify with what Paul. Paul says, would you be kind of easy on them? Would you kind of take it easy on them? And would you do what you can do to try to build them up and inspire them that God has a plan for their life to make a difference in their life? Aren't you glad for the God we serve today? Aren't you glad that He's here today, that His Spirit is here moving and working in our midst? As we close out today, Cindy's going to sing this song about this wonderful grace. And however God has spoken to you today, would you just listen to Him? He may be encouraging you to say, would you go talk to the pastor or pastors? There's people, we have wonderful people here. You've heard me brag everybody up. And I'm not just bragging people up, it's the truth. We have prayer warriors here. We have people who know how to touch heaven and, 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 and to pray and to, and, to, and to lift you up today. And that's what we want to do. But whatever the Lord will be having you to do today, would you just be obedient to him? Lord Jesus, right now as we close out, the remaining parts of this service. Thank you for your grace. Would you just thank you, Lord? Lord, we thank you for your grace. Every one of us here today, we never deserve what we got.
because you blessed us in a way that we didn't deserve it, but you blessed us. You've inspired us today. We pray, Lord, that we can inspire others, that we can truly be a blessing to other people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity as we just now listen to your voice and respond to you. Thank you, Jesus.